now uh, let's look let's look at one of the use case where how to design a suspension system uh now this is again a very basic uh simulation that i carried out uh this is a series of bumps that the vehicle is actually going through uh, and it is a continuous like a corrugated road uh, and uh, and the right ones are actually the acceleration levels on the rider seat and rider hand as mentioned and fft's of these ones uh, now you can see there are definite peaks uh in the frequencies in the frequency Uh, chart. I did a FFT of time time domain uh, and then converted to frequency domain. Uh, I can definitely see something happening at five hertz, so that means it can be the bounce mode. Now I I study these uh, system frequencies and my aim is to basically uh, reduce the effect of these because I cannot eliminate these frequencies because these are system characteristics. Uh, now to do that, how do I objectify? Uh, how much is the vibration so there is something called as vdv vibration dosage value uh, there is an iso standard also on this uh, what it does is uh, as i said uh, uh, like humans uh, they we don't really perceive every frequency as the same uh, impact so uh, depending on how we feel and how we uh, experience these different frequencies there are weighing fact functions uh, which are available and that's what vdv does so what happens is i got acceleration time history uh, logged on the vehicle or i have some simulation results i send it to my vdv computation uh, the computation happens separately for the seat and the uh, hand and the back and uh, then i take this weighing filter weighing function and i multiply it with the acceleration time history uh, and then i compute vdv it is a uh, fourth order integral uh, Uh, of the uh, acceleration value, and then I'll get the values. So let's say the values are lower than a particular threshold that I have set, which can be internal to any company. Then the design is okay. If it is not, then I go back to my simulation model uh, and start tuning suspension values or the vehicle weights or uh, uh, vehicle architecture itself if I have to change. So this is a loop that will keep on going, uh, and this is how we uh, study uh, these frequencies and the amplitudes of acceleration. uh if it is okay at a certain point of time if the vdv agreed upon internally with the company is okay then we move ahead and we say that the design actually go a ways to improve uh now this basically how do we uh improve and what kind of things we can we can do i think most of it i already talked about uh at the start of the vehicle uh when when we are actually at the concept stage what we can do is we can choose the spring and damping operations which account for these vibrations uh, it's a very tricky job to do uh, but the simulation models help here and uh, we can start playing with different different stiffness values and damping values the vehicle architecture is a very very important thing uh, where all uh, different uh, heavy masses are kept on the vehicle is very very important and uh, that's where the whole vehicle architecture study comes in again this can be studied through simulation i can place different different mass systems at different different locations of the vehicle and understand what is the effect on each frequency uh, avoid structural resonances as i already said uh, generally it is hard to avoid it uh, what a company or what a good product should do is uh, ideally in my experience it should be somewhere more than 30 32 hertz which is again a very tough thing to achieve achieve Uh, the reduce reduce the vdv as i talked about uh, there are ways to do it damping preload of the suspension stiffness multiple stiffnesses on the uh, stiffness curve of the uh, suspension uh, keeping options open for rear suspension design uh, the motion ratio should be chosen accordingly uh, higher the motion ratio uh, sorry lower the motion ratio let's say 0.2 0.3 can give higher uh, force values to the rider so try to keep it uh, close to 1 Uh, which is the case generally in active or vego or whatever scooters we see out there uh, correlate the subject evaluation because people are subjectively feeling the vibrations correlate that evaluation with the objective numbers uh, which is very important to do uh, then evaluate chassis stiffness and other frequencies as i said uh, the chassis stiffness should play a may play a major major role and that can should be evaluated uh, along with natural frequencies of the other systems so yeah that's that's what i can cover in road engage now moving on to uh, power train engage um, some of the very important points that these are cyclic in nature the vibrations are actually cyclic in nature because it is a function of uh, rpm of whatever is rotating 
and it can have multiple harmonics. Uh, uh, the amplitudes are not capable enough, capable enough to shake the body until and unless if it is a tractor or some other off-road vehicle or let's say a, a Royal Enfield also, uh, the engine can shake the vehicle. Uh, but the feeling is generally mostly a discomfort, uh, like a buzz kind of sensation at higher RPMs. You, everyone would have noticed uh, what, what I'm talking about. Uh, the types of problems that, that are there, and these are not fatal problems that I'm not going to uh, feel jerks like a suspension. These are mostly like a very discomfort kind of feelings at my handlebar or all the tactile points, or uh, if there is a rattle in the, in the gear or some sort of buzz within the car, for example, some sort of squeal happening within the car, some sort of body panels uh, giving me that discomfort. Those are the kind of problems that we're talking about here. Now, uh, in EVs, uh, how is it important? This is the, gen the, the general perception is uh, that since there is no engine, there is less noise, which is true to a certain level. But in absence of engine, what happens is motor, gearbox, or AC system, or tire, or some other plastics, they become dominant. And uh, those noises becomes very annoying. A uh, very simple curve to show here. Uh, this is some of the uh, G vehicle, if I am right. Uh, now, if you, if you notice that at higher vehicle speeds, the noise level difference between an EV and a uh, IC vehicle is not great. Uh, and the problems are all the same. Uh, at lower uh, vehicle speeds, yes, there is a huge difference. And hence, EVs are generally perceived to be less noisy. But that doesn't account for the higher speeds and we still have to study these noise sources and in fact it actually becomes a little complex in IC vehicles because of the major sources being involved. Uh, what are these sources? Uh, now the two obvious ones are electric motor uh, and the vibration signals are actually functions of number of poles within the motor. It can be 8 pole motor, it can be 16 pole or whatever number of poles are there. Generally uh, the vibration signals are function of those number of pulls. Our transmission system, it can be a gearbox or it can be a belt pulley system or uh, they can be different kind of uh, frequencies can be generated by the transmission. Uh, when, the, when the two gear meshes, uh, they, they, they create uh, certain noise or they create certain vibration. Uh, so electric motor and the transmission are the two major source. Electric motor drives the transmission. So in, in general, it is the electric motor itself. Now, how do we uh, uh, reduce it, uh, right? Or what exactly, uh, before, before we actually jump there, uh, what is an order plot? Uh, now, order plot uh, is something that is used to, uh, what do you say, study these vibrations. We were using F50 uh, for road and VH, right? And we can also, uh, but that, 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 will not give, that will not give me uh, a good enough picture uh, when I study powder in NVH. Why? Because uh, RPM is involved here. And for every RPM, the frequency shifts. So I have to look at something called as order plot. Now, this is a three axis plot. What it does is uh, it plots frequency on the X axis, uh, RPM on the Y axis. And uh, in the Z, it is the noise or the acceleration, whatever it is. Now, uh, as you see, uh, so this is actually uh, order plot for a motor, uh, which is revved up from 0 to 4000 RPM. Uh, it, is, it is revved up. So that is a very important thing. It is wide open throttle revved up. Um, now, uh, these black lines, if you can see, uh, these are functions of, uh, these are multiplications of these RPM. So three into whatever RPM is there uh, is the third order. Okay. Four into whatever RPM is there is the fourth order. Uh, so once you rev up the motor, you will start seeing these patterns. Uh, I can I cannot explain everything out there in the webinar, but I think you'll get a fair idea. And the vertical lines that you see uh, in the plot are nothing but the natural frequency of the vehicle, uh, because frequency cannot natural frequency cannot shift with RPM. Uh, it will stay there. So every time uh, I crosses particular speeds, I will uh, hit those natural frequency at different different speeds, and hence. Uh, we say that uh, powder in NVH can be good at certain speed and it can be horrible at some other speed. Uh, so hence it is all a function of the RPM. Now moving on, uh, let's, let's look at uh, a gearbox design and how we can 
uh, what do you say, use this, uh, whatever I talked about this thing, uh, motor and transmission in junction, how we can use this to design a gearbox. It's a very dummy gearbox. What you can do is now, let's say I have the RPM of the motor, which is let's say zero to one, one, five RPM in this case, it can go more than that. Uh, let's say eighth order eight into RPM, uh, is dominating. 16th order is also there and there is a 24th order also. Uh, now this 8, 16, 24, as I said, again, these are all functions of number of poles in the motor. Let's say the motor is an eight pole motor. So the obvious dominant one will be eighth order. It can be a harmonic of that 16th order and a subsequent harmonic of that, which is 24th order. Things are getting a little confusing, but bear with me. So uh, RPM of the motor, uh, then you have eighth order, uh, uh, that particular RPM, uh, 16th, 24th. And let's say in the transmission, uh, I have a pair of 25 teeth and the mesh frequency of that comes, uh, like this, which is again, a function of RPM, uh, at which the, the gear box is rotating or that particular gear is rotating. Now let's say the highlighted red ones, this is where the thousand Hertz, for example, not the thousand Hertz, uh, yeah, sorry, thousand hertz, my bad. Uh, this is where these frequencies will start matching with each other. Uh, this, let's say the 24th order is actually matching with a uh, thousand hertz here, which is uh, coming from the transmission. Once this happens, uh, that is where you will you will find a burst of energy either in the form of vibration or in the form of noise. And now it can definitely, if there was, let's say, th let's say thousand hertz, if let's say there was something uh, in my order plot, uh, if there was a, vertical peak in at thousand Hertz, then that would have, the vehicle would have vibrated at that point, or it, it could have created certain audible noise, which is called a structural bond noise in this case. Same thing can happen at uh, other RPM also. So this is, uh, uh, how we can look at, uh, now if I have to summarize this, the 24th order is actually dominating and the number of teeth in the primary gear is 25. So there is a high chance of this coupling that can happen uh, at every speed of the vehicle, obviously. If the vehicle resonance is, as I said, I think whatever I talked about is written here. If the vehicle's resonance is, uh, the vehicle natural frequency are actually 1000 hertz or the gearbox itself can vibrate, let's say, uh, the structural casing of the gearbox, if that can vibrate at this particular frequency, which is 2130, there will be high noises from the vehicle. Now, how do we uh, improve this? Um, we can definitely shift the natural frequency of the frame. Uh, possible, but it is very expensive to do because shifting it is, it will require a lot of architecture change and all of that. Uh, but the problem will not be solved because the shifting of the natural frequency will shift the problem to some other RPM and will again be stuck in the chicken and egg voila thing. Uh, we can choose the motor motor accordingly. Uh, uh, we can choose a particular motor that, that has the least amount of NVH, but that cannot, NVH cannot be given precedence over performance. So choosing a uh, motor is also, uh, I mean, it is an option, but it is not a very feasible option. Gearbox design, uh, this is something that we can do. Uh, we can chase number of gear issues. We can choose them accordingly so that they don't match with the motor. Uh, but this should be done at a very early stage of the vehicle before even starting to design any uh, gearbox or any other belt pulley system. We can isolate the powertrain, like the engine is isolated in other vehicles. We can isolate the powder, powertrain itself using some rubber bushes. Uh, this can be done very well, and this is a very, very good option, but for hub vehicles, uh, where the motor is actually hub motor, it is, it is not possible to do. Uh, also, it won't solve the problems coming from the gearbox. It can only solve from the motor. We can also use sound absorbing materials. Uh, we say, okay, you know what? We can't solve any noise issues. So let's use some sound absorbing material. That is a, it is a possible approach, but it is very expensive when it, it cannot be used in a two wheeler. It won't make any economical sense. So these are some of the ways that we can improve this. For two wheelers, uh, you can use the option three and four, uh, where either you can, uh, gearbox design is a very important thing to do. You can do that. Uh, fourth is you can isolate the powertrain, but only limited to non-hub uh, motor vehicles. For four wheelers, since I have the money, uh, I can bear some cost. I can also use the fifth option, which uh, generally people do. They use sound absorbing materials and all of that to uh, mask the noise. 
uh now that brings me to the final uh, uh topic which is acoustics i'll just briefly touch upon why is it important first of all it gives identity to a particular vehicle for example a ferrari has a distinctive sound associated with it uh the moment someone hears a ferrari engine roar that means uh people associate themselves uh so that is uh an important factor noise pollution obviously there are regulations and all those things so it is important to study acoustics uh although there is no safety in uh, safety risk involved uh but it is a annoying factor to any rider or driver how many times what we uh, go to let's say a classical example if i if i can say that uh, nissan kicks it's actually a very very good vehicle and uh, i haven't seen as a competitor to creta but a lot of issues or a lot of complaints are there in terms of engage uh now that can that can deteriorate the product uh, reviews over time people will start giving bad reviews in terms of engage and that becomes a problem for the company so it is important to study acoustics uh a basic chart of uh, you know what is painful what is noisy what is audible generally we try to keep uh, things less than 70 db uh, in terms of compact cars or vehicles heavy trucks and all this can go beyond 90 db also and uh, painful is obviously aircraft and all of that uh yeah so how do we uh, study sound then uh, before that let's talk about what are the problems in studying the sound uh, uh, the most important one and the most complex one is something called as uh, uh, so there is a there is a uh, what do you say um, a part inside our ear which i don't really know what that is i think it's called cochlea or something uh and it is logarithmic in shape uh, as you can see in the left side image so what it does is now you have your the sound travels through the ear canal and goes to that cochlea whatever that is and uh, what happens then is uh different because it is logarithmic in shape and if you if you see if i if i uh, stretch that logarithmic shape into a single line uh then the initial frequencies uh, will have more gaps compared to the later frequencies uh, which is a function of the logarithmic function itself uh what it does is a human ear then what it means is a human ear can can differentiate very clearly between lower frequencies but not clearly for higher frequencies so uh i can definitely uh differentiate between let's say very well between a 20 hertz and a 200 hertz signal but the differentiation will become tougher and tougher for let's say 1000 hertz or 4000 hertz uh that is a very very big problem because uh in any mathematics or wherever whenever there's a log that comes in problem starts to come in so that's for that purpose uh to objectify whatever biological uh function of the human ear is to objectify that uh, comes in critical bands filters and psychoacoustics as a study what it uh, does is so i'll i'll briefly talk about what critical band is uh what through subjective evaluation uh, over the years uh, what people have done is uh they have uh, separated uh and uh, what do you say separated different different sound signals or frequencies in terms of critical bands that uh, if let's say it is 1000 hertz then 1000 by 3 uh, to the negative and 1000 by 3 to the positive uh, this band will be heard at same uh, heard as same and that goes with all the frequencies it is very tough to explain here but i am trying my best on uh, explaining critical bands and all those things filters is something uh, if i start logging uh, uh if i start recording any microphone uh, from from any microphone the you cannot directly listen to uh that microphone logged signal and say that uh, this is real because what happens is the microphone is is not uh, it does not work as good as our human ear uh and uh, some sort of filters then has to be applied to make it equivalent to a human ear again it is equivalent it is it is not replicating uh all this leads to psycho psychoacoustic as the name suggests you hear a sound uh but then the brain uh is there 
and hence the psychoterms coming in psychoterm coming in the brain processes your sound and interprets interprets it and uh, that's how you get the signal signal uh, to your body uh, so basically it's not just the ear but it is ear plus your brain that does this processing and to understand all of this we need to uh, study psychoacoustic and this is a very very important thing because we can log all the signals we can log all the vibration values all the noise signals and all this but until and unless we don't know how to study them uh, and make sense out of it it won't do any justice to whatever we have done so yeah with that uh, i will end this so yeah